Welcome back to How to Be a Better DM, the official podcast of Monsters.Rent. I'm Justin Lewis. And I'm Tanner Wayland. And we are here to help you tell better stories for yourself and your players as you dungeon master sessions of D&D, Dungeons and Dragons. We'd like to give you some quick announcements. We actually have one before the show. And then after the show, if you want to stick around, we have some more announcements then as well. Uh, But first, let's talk about this. Tired of being alone? Are you tired of not having any of your players understand you? Are you tired of never truly belonging? Well, you're in luck. All you need to do is join the Guild. The Guild is a unique and exclusive experience that is only open to Dungeon Masters. It is a full community focused on helping ease your DMing burdens. Want to meet other DMs? Join the Guild. Want to discuss your homebrew ideas with people who would appreciate it instead of just telling your cat? Join the Guild. Want to find a place where all your wildest dreams will come true? Join the Guild. Go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free. Wait, that can't be right. Chuck, Chuck, can you check this again? Is this supposed to be... What? Oh, it's... They're serious? It's free? Oh, okay. All right. Yes, go to monsters.rent slash guild and sign up today for free even though they are crazy for giving this away for free. Common side effects may include burping, sneezing, laughing, breathing, hearing, listening, tasting, farting, critting, sarcasm, and in extreme cases, explosive diarrhea. Awesome. With that out of the way, we can get into today's show. You sit down at the fire. You've traveled a long distance to reach these particular nomads. You've heard tell that these nomads have mystical powers and can guide you to find unknowable secrets. You look around. Their long arms show a fierce exterior, but they've let you sit in their circle. They've shared their meat with you. Their hair hides their faces, though, though you can see pinpricks of light reflect off their eyes, hidden behind their hair. They seem to look at you expectantly. Um, what am I? It's at that moment that one of their numbers starts beating a drum produced from somewhere within the folds of their outer garments. More drums appear, and the rhythm continues and amplifies. Soon the sound of beating drums is all you hear. It echoes the beating of a heart. Not your heart, but the communal heart of this tribe. You let yourself fall into the rhythm. After a moment, you notice an elder stand up and walk towards the central fire. He chants some things and then throws some dust into the fire. There's a puff of green smoke and you smell a distinctly earthy smell. Soon your senses become slurred and you seem to drift from reality. Your eyes open and instead of at a ritual fire, you're standing waist deep in the ocean. You look over and you see another tribal member standing with you. You both wield spears and look for fish. You throw your spear, flash! Instead of being near a ritual fire, you're crouching low in a snowy copse of trees. You peer out from behind some bushes and see an Arok munching on greenery. The rest of your hunting party has snuck around to flank the beast. You hear the double hoot of an owl. That's the signal. You jump up and charge to attack the beast. Flash! Instead of at a ritual fire, you're in a grotto. You see a large stone monolith. Inscribed on the stone are ancient ruins. They glow softly blue in the dim light. At the base of the monolith is a pool of water that seems pure. As you approach, it starts to glow light blue. This is what you've come for. So what would you like to do? Welcome back to another episode of How to Be a Better DM. I'm your host, Justin Lewis, and together, you and I will learn how to tell better stories as we DM sessions of Dungeons & Dragons 5e. First of all, I've got to say thank you so much. Since we've started the show, we've seen amazing growth that I never could have predicted, and it's all because of you guys. You guys have allowed us to create cool t- cool content and spread it to some awesome people, and frankly, you've showed us that what we're doing is worthwhile. Uh, next, don't forget to listen to the end of today's episode to hear how you can support the show, but now let's talk about immersion. 
I'm not going to be talking about virtual reality, though we can all expect that within our lifetimes we'll see all sorts of leaps and bounds in that area, specifically with Dungeons and Dragons, I believe. I'm talking Oasis level leaps and bounds. But I'm talking today about learning to help your players feel like they are in your world. You have to help your players slip the bonds of our time and space and instead drift through the planes to the material plane on which you play D&D. So this is how you do it. Number one, better descriptions. No amount of cool voice changing software or LED lights will cover up bad storytelling. Storytelling is character, plot, voice, and conflict. It's also scene. You need to be able to paint pictures with your words. Work on your descriptions of all points of your gameplay. There's a fine balancing act here, though. You can't take forever describing something, but you also shouldn't do it in just one word. You need to be concise yet evocative. It's helpful to describe things using your senses. And don't forget that sixth sense we all get. You know, like when there's tension in the air and no one is saying anything, but you can feel that something is wrong. One thing I'd recommend steering away from, though, is that somewhat, you know, it's a crutch that we use and it's using analogies from our world. I struggle with this a lot because it's so helpful and it's super easy, but I think it pulls your players out of the world you're describing when you compare it to something, to a thing that exists in our real world. Another point I'd like to bring up is you don't have to describe everything, but you, you should describe the notable things, the things that someone would take note of the things that are different or unique. Number two is know the lore. I know you thought you were done studying after you graduated high school or college, but it makes things feel really weird when your players ask an NPC a question and the NPC can't respond immediately. Like, hey, what's your mother's name? Oh, sorry, let me look that up. On the other hand, it feels really real when your player asks an NPC a question and the NPC responds almost immediately. There's something magical when you as the dungeon master know the names and major players in the plot instead of having to immediately reference the guidebook to remember that the villain's henchman's name is Bothegg and that Bothegg loves to eat silver-spotted mushrooms that allow him to have very special dreams at night. If you're an advanced dungeon master, you can do better than that. And I'm not saying you need to know everything, but you do need to be able to give an interesting response when people expect it. Number three, a seamless experience. This is kind of tailing on to number two. You need to know what you're doing in every session. I don't mean, you know, you don't need to be a professional dungeon master, but instead you need to kind of understand that what's going to happen. And I completely understand having to take a minute or two to make up an entire encounter that you didn't plan on. We've all been there, but you can at least put in efforts to make sure the encounters you did plan are seamless. Part of it is making sure you've understood the sequence of events. Another part is making sure you have the NPCs lined up. And a final part is going through all of this in your head so you aren't constantly checking notes and stammering one second. It takes practice, of course, but this is the standard you want to set for yourself. You want it to be a seamless experience. And maybe the best thing you can do to that is just take a little bit more time in speaking your thoughts. Number four is voice changing. While being one of the most common things most of us do while driving to work in the morning... Wait, is that just me? Anyways, uh, changing your voice to fit your NPCs can go a long way to helping your players immerse themselves into the game. A quick YouTube search will give you so many results for tips and tutorials on how to actually make your voice change in a convincing way. And another option is actually acting lessons. Most of us wrote off acting when we were younger. I know I did. And uh, now we spend a lot of time watching professional actors on TV and think maybe it wasn't such a good idea to brush that off. Maybe I could be someone like that. And I'm not saying I could be. But what I'm saying is I think we need to give acting a little bit more attention. So, and, and honestly, the goal here isn't so much to highlight your own acting skills. It's to allow the players to step into a world in my opinion, where they can themselves become someone else. That's the, that's the goal. You want to create a world where it feels real, but your players also adopt new voices and acting and things like that. Number five is better role-playing. I know that most of us feel awkward role-playing. We, we grew up playing make-believe, and then for some weird reason, we stepped away from it. It felt childish to pretend to be someone we're not. So we stopped. We hit it. 
We found that we do funny voices and accents while we're, while we're alone in our car, driving to or from work. Again, maybe that's just me. But we never do that in front of someone else. Or if we do, it's never in a structured way. It's just fun. Let me tell you, role-playing can make or break the immersion. There have been times when I've paused and said, oh, let's see, what would that NPC say? Because I didn't know what a particular NPC would say. The momentum halted and the mood broke. There have been other times when I've thrown caution to the wind and said something somewhat ridiculous, but I committed, and I felt that the table enjoyed the risk. So when you sit at your table, try and step into the role of the character you're playing. Try being an actor for a second, like I said. It's okay. You won't be perfect, and no one will judge you. And if they do, just add 10 hit points to the baddie in the next encounter and call it good. Number six is mood lighting. Admittedly, this is low on the list of things you should do to make your game more immersive, but... Mood lighting can be an awesome way to, well, get your players in the mood. It's also possible to become a distraction if you make it really complicated. So I would say, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, set up something and then leave it for a while to see how it works before changing it over and over and over. Uh, one simple thing I saw recently, and uh, spoiler alert, close your ears if you haven't seen the newest Stranger Things, but in the newest Stranger Things, D&D is a, a large theme. And one thing that one of the characters do does in their sessions is they just light a bunch of candles. I think that is a tremendous way to create some mood lighting because in most of our games, we are playing with pretty low tech, so candles was the light fixture of the time. And so it, it's a really nice and easy way and relatively cheap to hop back in time. Number seven, this might be a tough one, but it's most important, I think, and, and it's going to be tough specifically for those of us who, who like to use our phones for managing our character. You need to make a rule at the table that everyone's main focus will be on the game. There are always extenuating circumstances, but for the most part, removing distractions is an easy and, in my opinion, necessary step to achieving the nirvana of a gameplay experience. It gets very old looking up from my DM screen and seeing certain players scrolling on their phones rather than engaging in the game. I also do appreciate the fact that my wife uses a paper character sheet. She says she, says she prefers it, but I think it has something to do with her knowing that being on her phone would be much more distracting. And let me tell you, I've had moments where I was trying to explain a pretty pivotal scene for one of my characters while some other characters are showing each other funny videos. And... Uh, yeah, I was not happy. Um, so don't don't let your characters do that. Just ask everyone to be respectful, remove distractions so that everyone can really enjoy the immersion. Number eight is the occasional real-life prop. While a most costly method of immersion, popping out the occasional prop can help your players transcend their natural bonds and reach an elevated space of gameplay. When your characters buy a map, it can drastically change the way they play, when you hand them a real-life map. Again, this is more costly in terms of time and money, but it could be just the juice you need to spice things up. Uh, if you want some great examples, check out Critical Role. I mean, obviously everyone knows about them, um, but it doesn't even have to be that big. You might even decide to create a scenario where your characters are invited to a banquet and you work with your characters and things like that, and you actually make a real-life banquet. That's, that's a pretty fun way to bring the game alive. Number nine, practice. Nothing beats practice, period. No amount of cool props or amazing voices will cover for the fact that your story is garbage. And if you can't tell a story, you can't make up for it. At least not in the long run. So first things first, or if nothing else, start playing D&D. &D. You need to at least get in the habit of role-playing. The next step after that is to start DMing. So find a group where you can experiment and try things out. What you are looking for is iteration and repetition rather than one-and-done experiences. So if you want to get better at immersion, you need to learn how to immerse yourself first, and then you can learn how to immerse others. And number 10, true mastery of plot crafting. Almost nothing can cover up a bad plot. I've said this over and over and over again. Nothing can cover up a bad story. Your players will never enjoy a bad or boring story, no matter how many cool doodads you have. So spend time working on the main tenets of a plot. Impl improve the conflicts, twists, and tension, and resolution. 
you can't expect your players to enjoy or, or immerse themselves in a story that you truly aren't immersed in or crazy about. And that speaks to another point. If you're not having fun with your story, you need to change things up immediately. Otherwise, your players will catch on to that and they will stop coming. There you have it. 10 ways to make your D&D campaign more immersive. Number one is better descriptions. Number two, know the lore. Number three, create a seamless experience. Number four, try some voice changing practices. Number five, better role playing. Number six, try some mood lighting. Number seven, remove all distractions that you can. I mean, obviously, I know that kids are a thing. Number eight, the occasional real life prop. Number nine, practice, 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 practice. And number 10, true mastery of plot crafting. Thank you guys again for listening to today's episode. I just got to give a quick shout out to all the people who've reached out. Uh, you know who you are. I won't, I won't say many names just because I don't want to miss anyone, but it's, it's, it's such a cool thing getting messages on Instagram saying, hey, thanks so much for creating this. This is awesome. Uh, and uh, more than anything, it gives me a chance to kind of dig deeper and ask you some more questions about what you like, what you're wanting more of, what you don't really like, what's not working, and, and hopefully help us create an even better show for you. So, you know what? Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoy any of the announcements we have, but uh, we'll see you next Thursday for another wonderful show. Happy adventuring, and until next time, let's roll initiative. Thank you for listening to today's show. Uh, we really appreciate your support and your patronage. We have a few more announcements to go over. Uh, first, did you ever fall in love with the library as a kid? It was a place where you could experience a thousand stories without having to buy a thousand books. That is what Monsters at Rent can do for your D&D campaign. You can rent and swap out as many quality miniature monsters and creatures for your D&D party as you could ever want, without having to buy them. You can rescue villagers from a kobold camp, or lead your party through the fighting forest, or many more adventures. We're coming out with new bundles all the time. Just sign up for our subscription to get access to your own personal library of minis. Go to monsters.rent to find out more. That's the website, monsters, with an S, dot rent. Get your library pass to a world of minis today. We also wanted to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Stardust and Dragons. I'm going to let one of the cast of Stardust and Dragons, Christian Hatcher, and his crew tell you a little bit more about it. This August, a new adventure podcast is coming to a platform near you, filled with action, you one of the two of them. We can't right. keep taking hits like that. Drama. Everything that she's been doing, everything, she, everything she's going to do, finally sets in. And Stardust. Help! Help! <coughs> Someone, please! Find out more about this epic odyssey at stardustanddragons.com, where adventure awaits in the stars. That's all the announcements we have today. Again, thank you so much for everything you do for us. You make this show possible. Like we said before, we'll be back next week with another great episode. And until then, let's go ahead and roll initiative.